The Manhattan Project was overseen by Major General Leslie Groves of the U.S. Army, with the bulk of the research done by nuclear physicist Robert Oppenheimer. This massive undertaking of a project to develop the first nuclear bombs quickly grew to employ more than 130,000 people. Before we get into the real stuff, we first have to look at how this is even possible. And if you're going to look for an answer for that, first let me point you to these guys. German chemist Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann. The two discovered what is now known as nuclear fission. In late 1939, Albert Einstein drafted a letter that urged the United States to acquire stockpiles of uranium ore. Included in this letter was a plea to the U.S. to also research nuclear chain reactions. This letter was sent to President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Roosevelt receiving the letter, then contacting the National Bureau of Standards to head the Advisory Committee on Uranium. The committee reported back to Roosevelt saying that uranium would provide a possible source of bombs with the destructiveness vastly greater than anything now known. Now at a crucial point in the war, Columbia University professors created the first nuclear fission reaction after following the theoretical work of Hahn and Strassmann. The same team then built a series of prototype nuclear reactors. The next step for the United States was to invest $167,000 on research into uranium while the states were working away building mass killing technology as fast as they could, the British finally did something by discovering the critical mass of uranium. Critical mass being the smallest amount of fissile material needed for a sustained nuclear chain reaction. They figured it out it was about 22 pounds. Despite 22 pounds being just a fraction of what your mother weighs, because of this discovery, the U.S. now knows that the bomb is small enough to fit on an aircraft. That's not all the Brits did. In July of 1940, Britain partnered with the states to trade all scientific research relating to the projects. However, the U.S. quickly discovered that the British were much further ahead in their research and way more advanced than the U.S. Keep in mind that about this time in 1943, only two milligrams of uranium have ever been produced. After following Oppenheimer's research for the bombs, the Allies had a few options of aircraft capable of carrying what ended up to be a 17-foot-long thin man bomb or the 59-inch wide fat man bomb. The original plan was to use the British Aviro Lancaster, except the Brits can't do anything right, so due to the maintenance concerns, the Air Force instead chose the American Bowie B-29 Super Fortress. At this point in the war, President Roosevelt instructed that if the atomic bombs were ready before the war with Germany ended, the U.S. should be ready to drop bombs on Germany. A joint targeting committee of the Manhattan District was established to determine which key cities should be targeted. They recommended these four on the screen here. However, Henry L. Stimson intervened, announcing that he would make the final targeting decisions and that he would not authorize the bombing of Kyoto on the grounds of its historical and religious significance. Groves therefore asked to remove Kyoto, not just from the list of targets, but from targets from conventional bombings as well. One of Kyoto's substitutes, however, was Nagasaki. With the authorization to use the bombs against Japan already given, no alternatives were considered after the Japanese rejection of the surrender agreement called the Postdam Declaration. The ultimatum stated that if Japan did not surrender, it would face prompt and utter destruction. On August 6, 1945, the Boeing B-29 Super Fortress lifted off with a little boy in its bomb bay. Hiroshima, the headquarters of the 2nd General Army and 5th Division, was the primary target of the mission, with Kakura and Nagasaki as alternatives. The bomb was assembled in the air to minimize the risk of a nuclear explosion in the event of a crash during takeoff. The bomb detonating at an altitude of 1750 feet with a blast that was later estimated to be the equivalent of 13 kilotons of TNT. An area of approximately 4.7 square miles was destroyed, 69% of Hiroshima's buildings in ice were destroyed, and another 7% damaged. About 70 to 80,000 people were killed immediately, with another 70,000 injured. Just three days later, a second B-29 lifted off with a fat man rocket on board. This time, Kaukura was the primary target. Takeoff with the weapon already armed this time, however, the electrical safety plugs were still engaged. When they reached their primary target, they found cloud coverage had obscured the city, prohibiting the visual attack requested by orders. After three runs of the city with fuel running low in the aircraft, they headed to their secondary target, Nagasaki. A last-minute break in the clouds over Nagasaki allowed a visual approach as requested by orders. The Fat Man rocket was dropped over the city's industrial valley. The resulting explosion had a blast with the yield equivalent to 21 kilotons of TNT, but was confined to just the Yurikami Valley, as a major portion of the city was protected by the hills. 
resulting in destruction of about 44% of the city. The bombing also crippled the city's industrial production extensively, killing 29,000 Japanese industrial workers, 150 soldiers. Overall, an estimate of around 35 to 40,000 people were killed and 60,000 injured. If you think that sounds bad enough, the U.S. expected to have another atomic bomb ready for the use on August 19th, with three more in September and a further three in October. Two more Fat Man rockets were assembled and readied and scheduled to leave in mid-August. During this time, the Los Alamos Labs technicians worked 24 hours straight to cast another plutonium core to get more nuclear bombs ready. A total of four weapons, the Trinity Gadget, Little Boy, Fat Man, and an unused Fat Man bomb, were produced by the end of 1945, making the average cost per bomb around $500 million in 1945 dollar. With that all said and done, the project cost about $1.89 billion, with over 90% of the cost being for building factories and producing materials, with only less than 10% for development and production of the actual weapons themselves. Research and production took place on more than 30 sites across the U.S., the U.K., and Canada.